Peter Churchhouse is another person who has seen China like few others. He's a successful businessman who arrived in Hong Kong in 1980 and soon went on to run Morgan Stanley's Asia division. He was there long before the explosive growth of China, and he's seen it all happen firsthand. I came to Hong Kong in uh, 1980, so I've been here nearly 39 years now. I came to, uh, to help build a new town uh, in the new territories in Hong Kong. And uh, at that time, Shenzhen, which is the city just north of Hong Kong, uh, that, that city was not a city, it was a village of about 300,000 people. Uh, and you walked around that village, there were people, blacksmiths beating wow. charcoal implements in the street. There were no buses, no taxis, no cars. Now, it's a city of 11 million people. It's the center of the biggest manufacturing conglomeration in the planet. Uh, that area now has a GDP roughly the size of Russia, slightly, slightly smaller than Spain. And that was nothing. It had nothing uh, 38 years ago. So it's that's the kind of development. potentially the highest tech company in the world. Oh, oh, oh yes. I mean, so many of the, the China and the, the European and American tech companies have their operations based in, in, in that area. Uh, 66 million people in that area right now. It's, it, it has the biggest manufacturing center in the world. It has 400 million air passengers flying through that place. Uh, and people just don't quite get that. You know, it's, 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 it's so huge. And it's, it's gone from, as I say, from T-shirts to drones, yeah, to well. smartphones. Uh, and and it's, it, it's going to be investing a lot more money in research, R&D, I think, in that zone over the next uh, few years. So you can expect to see that Shenzhen special economic zone, that whole area, become probably one of the most important tech hubs, uh, I think, on the planet. Uh, they would like to rival Silicon Valley. I'm not saying saying they will, but uh, I think that's kind of their objective. One of the, one of the extraordinary things for me also was when I visited Shenzhen in the '90s, it was unattractive to say the least. It was <laughs> an industrial area, you know, manufacturing, but old school manufacturing. And uh, but today there was so much green space, and I've seen that in all the Chinese cities. Can you talk? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, when these you, you, you visited these cities back in the early days they were pretty soul-destroying places to a large extent. So they've started from a blank sheet of paper. So they've leapfrogged all of that, that, uh, that antique technology and they've gone straight to 21st century stuff. And as a result, they've created urban environments in many respects which are in some ways better than what you find in many developed countries because they've started from scratch. They've planned it from square one. And particularly, you can see that in places like Pudong and Shanghai. Uh, when I first went to Pudong, uh, it, it was like a, a, a scene out of a Mad Max movie. Wow. It was awful. It was just soul destroying. What year was that? That was in the in the late 80s, early 90s. And of course, they started that planning of that area. It was just squalid industrial nothingness for mile after mile. And within five years, it uh, built well over 100 high-rises, some of the tallest buildings in the world there now, uh, beautiful boulevards laid out, huge estates, housing and so on, a new airport. Uh, that was all done in less than 10 years. And uh, so the, the resources that get applied to these situations in the urban context uh, it, it does, it does a, some really interesting stuff. Of course, there's a lot of stuff that isn't that great either, uh, but by and large, I think it's a lot better than was there before. So you told a story about one of the first uh, real estate missions you went to Shanghai. Can you tell that story? <laughs> yeah, that was very amusing. I was working in a real estate consultancy and uh, uh, somebody what year was this, uh, this in, uh, in Hong Kong uh, called Jones Lang Wooten in those days. It's now Jones Lang LaSalle. And uh, somebody commissioned us to do a study of the office market in Shanghai. So we zoomed up to Shanghai and really this research study took all of about an hour and a half or two hours because it was only one building one modern office building in Shanghai and this was back in 87 about that 86 87 uh, so to do a survey of the office market literally took us half an hour that was it 
And what was worrying, everybody was concerned because there was another building under construction. <laughs> and the fear was this one building would lead to a massive oversupply of space. Wow. And of course, you look, that, look at that now and you think how ridiculous that, that notion was when you look at just hundreds and hundreds of state-of-the-art modern high-rise buildings, you know, 80, 100 stories high, this kind of thing. At the time, it was one building. Yeah. And that's, that's not that long ago. That was only in, that's only uh, 87, 88. Yeah, yeah. So that shows you the sort of pace that you've years, got. Yeah, yeah. unbelievable. It's amazing, yeah. So yeah, you've, 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 you've been Asia strategist for, for your whole career, really. I mean, I, I realize it's been real estate, but uh, you've been tracking Asia at least. Um, can the moment that you see now in China, does it resemble, like, uh, I don't know if you go back to the Industrial Revolution or, or to a time in another country in your career? Or? I think it's very interesting, but I think genuinely, uh, the transformation we've seen in China in the last 30 years or so is nothing like anything we've seen anywhere else. Yes, the Industrial Revolution, but that, that took place over 50 or 100 years. This has taken place over 10 or 20 years. And, and the scale of the transformation is much more rapid than anything we've ever seen. So you've gone from, you've gone from, uh, uh, from, from agriculture, uh, farming, uh, c communes, nobody owning anything, to a, a society where people uh, have, have now got a, a livelihood. They're, they're some of the, uh, they've really j j jumped into the middle class, the middle income category. Hundreds of millions of people brought out of poverty. Now that I can't, I can't remember having seen that anywhere else in my lifetime. That's for sure. <laughs> no, well, the, the thing here is, if you think about it, uh, China has lifted 600 million people out of poverty over the last 20 years or so, and they've been brought into middle-income status. And in the next 20 years, China will become a high-income status country, in my view. So that transformation is probably the most rapid and significant, I think, in humankind ever. You've seen other little countries, they get an oil rush, you know, uh, in the Middle East you get oil comes through and uh, oil prices jump up and suddenly they're very wealthy, but it's, it's a, a, a 10, 20 million people. This is over a billion people and it's not stopping here. There's still a long way to go. Uh, as, as I said earlier, you're going to have another 150 million people move into cities uh, and live in modern homes and do jobs and education and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I think this is, you know, we're 30 years into it. We've probably got another 20 before we get to what one might call a mature economy. Uh, we're still a few years away from that. So let's enjoy it. So yeah, so what would you urge investors to do? Well, I think my sense is that, look, you, you, you've got to look at a place like China as a long-term thing, not really as just a, a trading market, uh, because it, it is very volatile. Um, and, and I think you're going to look at it as a, in the point of view that, that this is an, a, a, it's a, not only a, a growing and rapidly growing economy, it's a transformative e economy. And it's, it's going up the value added scale very, very rapidly. Uh, the, this trade war, I think, or what, what passes as a trade war, I think is going to generate a huge amount of investment in high tech businesses in China and these guys are going to grow very very rapidly um, you know so many industries uh, bio biotech biochemical chemistry uh, and drones artificial intelligence robotics they're putting billions and billions in R&D and development in these areas and and that's where I think you're going to see a lot of uh, big opportunities over the course of the next few years and as Chinese people themselves invest in their own market uh, and through institutions like pensions and, and insurance companies and banking products and so on, uh, you're going to see this market easily you know, become a mature market, could double, triple in, in the next 10 years. So would you, for a, for a five to seven year investment, would you put your money on US blue chips or Chinese blue chips? Well, I'll put it this way, your relative valuation right now, uh, yes, the US still looks very good in short term, but I think when you look at relative valuation, China's down here in valuation, America's up here in valuation. That's going to come into balance, I would say, over the next few years. And uh, that suggests that China's valuation is going to rise uh, to become a little closer uh, to the Western markets and, and particularly to the U.S.
This Hong Kong is the fourth or fifth biggest financial center in the world. Macau is by far the biggest gambling center in the world. Seven times the revenues of Las Vegas Strip. So you know, people don't understand the scale and dimension that we live in in this little corner of China. Yeah, you mentioned Macau. The growth truly is staggering. I remember just a few years ago when they said, is Macau going to pass Las Vegas? Could it ever pass that? And then tell me what's happened. Well, of course, now, it was only about 10 years ago, it was about two thirds the size of Las Vegas. Now it's like six or seven times the size of Las Vegas in terms of uh, turnover. And they're shifting the mix. It's not just gambling and gaming. They're doing a lot more in terms of uh, exhibitions, conferences, uh, family entertainment, and so on. And a lot of that growth is spilling over across the border into China itself. So it's not just now in Macau, it's across the border in China as well. And it's the only place in China you can gamble. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. so that, that makes it a very attractive uh, place to be. And this part of the world, people love, love the horses, they love to gamble, they love the card tables, it's, uh, and Macau's where you do it. Yep. So, uh, so speaking of gambling, can you tell me a little bit about what the actual Chinese, the local Chinese investor um, has been like, uh, the, the stock market investor in China, for the last, say, 15 years, what, versus well, look, what, what you think they might look like five years from now. Yeah, I mean, basically the China stock market really only started in 1991, 92, 93. It's almost totally driven by retail. It's not driven by institutional investors the way uh, Western markets are. So, And when you say retail, what, is, what does that mean? Private individuals, families, uh, trading, trading platforms, uh, corporates, putting their money to work in the stock market. It's not driven by pension funds. It's not driven by mutual funds, insurance, and so on. Uh, but that is going to change. Uh, as, as China develops, we're going to see much more institutional activity in the market. And that will bring, I think, not only growth, uh, but I think it'll also bring stability, uh, a little less volatility to the market. Because at the moment, being retail driven, People jump in, they jump out, it's extremely volatile. Uh, but that, that's, that's gonna change because at the moment, China families, China people, have very few avenues to invest their money. They are great savers. They save something like 45% of national income, GDP, is actually saved. So where does that money go? Not many places to put it. Uh, and of course, one of the places it goes is property. And uh, the stock market is the only other place. There is no mutual fund industry. Uh, so I, I'm expecting, I could see that market over the next four or five years, you could see a period when that market doubles, uh, maybe even 150% over the period of a year to 18 months. So what it's market happened is before, this? and that's, that would, I, would, I would say the, a, the, uh, the A share market in China could easily put on that kind of pace over a period of say uh, 12 to 18 months. Uh, because it's starting from a, now from a very low base. Unbelievable. So you're talking about pension funds and institutional investors coming along. So there, are there any ob obvious opportunities when these larger institutions become investors in the market? Well, I, of course, as the market's opened up, it's becoming more accessible to foreign investors as well. So as, as the market develops, you, you're going to see that more and more foreign investors will access that market. So that's going to be another driver to the stock market. As you know, uh, MSCI uh, is, is increasing its weighting in its global indices uh, of the, of the uh, Shanghai and the Shenzhen stock market. So that will attract foreign investors increasingly. Yes, it's only a small proportion at the moment, but if we go along over the next few years, that's going to be a significant uh, factor as well. So you, you're not only going to have the domestic players growing, the pension funds, uh, the insurance companies and so on, uh, many of whom are listed and have tremendous investment opportunities in their own right, uh, but you're also going to get the foreign institutional investors coming in as well. So is there a sector that's uh, particularly cheap that's going to benefit uh, significantly from these uh, pension assets? Well, I, I, I think the banking and financial sector is very, very cheap. If you look at the big four uh, state banks, uh, they're the biggest banks in the world in terms of deposit base. Uh, they're trading at 0 0.7, 0 0.8 times book value. Where do you find huge behemoth banks trading that cheap? It doesn't happen. Five, six times earnings. They're growing at not particularly rapidly at the moment, but as the credit uh, issues get solved in China, these banks are going to grow earnings at 10 to 15 percent, and they're trading at you know, 0.7 times book value. 
that is that's that's the wrong price for banks yeah. of that scale. I mean, uh, it, it, a double is easily possible. Oh, ab absolutely. You, you could easily see these banks trading at 1.5, 1.6 times book. Uh, that's a doubling in value, not including not the including returning earnings growth. Earnings. Yes, as well. And at the, at the moment, they're giving you a five or six percent dividend yield as well. So you're being paid to wait uh, at the moment. So that's the sector I like. Uh, the insurance sector we've mentioned. Again, there's just enormous growth potential in that area. Uh, and my specialty, of course, is the real estate sector. And, well, well uh, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, Americans see um, China as this communist place. And meanwhile, they, they think that this is where their, their, their cheap t-shirts come from. Meanwhile, an apartment in Beijing is over a million dollars. So how does real estate, can, any comment, can you give us a comment on real yeah, estate? Yeah, well, if you, if you think For, about so it. So Americans can understand yeah, it. Yeah, you think about it, 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, uh, it, was, it was impossible to own property in China. Nobody owned property except the state or the communes. It was all held by the state. Uh, now, private ownership is possible. And that has produced this enormous boom in, uh, in urban, uh, urban centers, the urban ownership. Something like 56% uh, uh, urban rate, urbanization rate in China right now. That was 24% 20 years ago. So you've gone from 24% living in cities to 56, 58% living in cities. That's going to go to 75% wow. in the next 10 years. So we're going to see another 130, 150 million people move to the cities in China over the next 10 or 12 years. They need to be housed. Who's going to do it? They're going to want to own their own housing. So that's a big growth sector. These stocks are trading right now. I can buy top quality stocks at five, six times earnings. Unbelievable. And div giving me a 7% dividend yield. Unbelievable. So where in the world can you do that? It's very, very rare. So yes, the sector is under a bit of a cloud at the moment, but when I see companies that trade at that kind of valuation, uh, I, I think I can afford to wait until the market sentiment turns. So uh, this is a genuine question. Uh, we've got these, this incredible growth in this, in this country, uh, in China. And uh, we've got these incredible tailwinds coming. They're longer-term tailwinds, and uh, you know we know the growth story. So, uh, why why are stocks so cheap? What are people afraid of, and what what would be the catalyst? Uh, any ideas? Any yeah, thoughts on this? I, I mean, at the moment, it's really macro-driven. Uh, sort of trade war. Yeah, yeah the, obviously the trade issue is a is a big negative for all emerging markets, and particularly for China because it's been such a big. Uh, export-oriented country, but most of Asia is export-oriented. Uh, so all of Asia is being hit here quite quite badly. The other negative in China right now is the credit, credit extension. You now have a, a total debt to GDP ratio of about 260%. Uh, a lot of that in, in corporate debt, not household debt, in corporate debt. So there, there is some concern that that could lead to some kind of financial crisis. I, I think there is certainly going to be an increase in uh, uh, defaults and non-performing loans, but I'm not expecting a financial crisis. I think, you know, with, with three and a half trillion US dollars of reserves uh, and a banking system which is totally under control of the government, they see these problems and they are constantly doing stuff every week, every month to, to address the problems. And I, I've watched it so many years that when they see these problems, they act and gradually they fix them. And I think this financial issue will be one of those problems like we've seen before, which they will just gradually fix. And, and 18 months from now, we won't even be thinking about it. Two years, it'll be a memory. Wow. Now, you have been here almost 40 years. The Hong Kong stock market has been one of the most volatile markets over that period of time. But the, so you have seen incredible busts in your lifetime here, yeah. but then you've seen the long-term result of this. So, can you talk about, uh, you know, what a bust looks like, how bad it can be, and will there be busts along the way in China's stock market? Uh, well, of course there will be, because there will always be, like any country, there's always going to be excesses uh, take place. And we saw it in China three or four years ago, the retail investors were buying the market like crazy, the market went up to over 5,000, uh, stock prices were through the roof. Uh, earnings, uh, price earnings ratios were at 50 times earnings, uh, and that's unsustainable. We, we kind of know that, uh, and so, but we don't see that now. 
Uh, we will see it again, I'm sure. But at the moment, that's exactly the opposite. Uh, and and we're, we're facing, I think, a, 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 at some point in the next 18 months or two years, we're going to start to see sentiment coming back the other way. So uh, Hong, Kong is, Hong Kong is like a pimple on the backside of an elephant, <laughs> uh, if you think about it. We're a city of 7 million people. Uh, as the, the conduit for finance for a country which is the second largest economy in the world, Hong Kong acts as a financial conduit. The money comes in and out, the trade comes in and out, the ideas, the technology, the expertise comes in and out of this city. So as long as that continues, which I think it will, uh, we're going to see Hong Kong, I think, has a reasonably bright future economically. Politically, it might be very different, but economically, I think it's a pretty, pretty bright future. And, and uh, within that, you're going to see much more growth of institutional investment in China itself through the pension funds. You know, the, hardly anybody has a pension in, in China right now, a private pension. There's not a big mutual fund industry. Uh, so there's not a big insurance industry. So as these industries take root, they are going to be big investors as well. So you've got not just the retail, not just the foreign investors, but you've got a burgeoning uh, institutional investment universe locally. Uh, and as I say, with a savings ratio of 45%, that savings needs to be invested somewhere. So the stock market is going to be a home for a lot of that money. And you'll also see the bond market grow rapidly as well. Uh, mainly corporate bonds, I think, rather than government bonds. Uh, but that, the bond market's going to be a big, uh, uh, a, a big place to park money as well. So any very simple way, if you're at a, if we were at a, a cocktail party in Nebraska, <laughs> and someone said, why China? Do you have just a simple, you know, I don't believe in China. What, tell me, tell me in, a, in a sentence or two, if, if you can boil it down, just, uh, and again, you're talking to the guy who thinks China is a bunch of communists, a bunch, you know, he doesn't know anything about China. Why China? Well, China is an example of a country that has gone from the Stone Ages into the 21st century over a space of 30 years. So it's, it's really a fundamental transformation of a society and an economy, which the likes of which I've never seen. I don't think anybody's seen this kind of transformation uh, in this kind of time frame anywhere in the world, not least a country with 1.3 billion people. So from a, it's just a pure transformation, structural reform, growth story. Uh, and and that's, that's what you're buying. And China's becoming part of the global uh, framework of the economy. Uh, they're, they're so far into it now, they can't go back. And, uh, and, and we, we just, I, I think it'd be crazy not to participate in it, even in a small way. You don't need to jump in boots and all, but I, I think this is a, a growth story that's gonna run for at least another 10 or 20 years. And, uh, you know, I've been here 38 years. Uh, I'm gonna hopefully around for another 20 to participate in it. Yeah, I think the thing that most people have to remember is that China isn't a communist country anymore. It's not a Marxist uh, communist regime like it was under Mao Zedong. Uh, it has advanced much more into what you might call a form of autocratic capitalism. It's still a dictatorship. It's still an autocracy. It's not a true democracy by any means. But think about it. Most of the economy is now run by private sector interests, by private companies who are doing their own thing, investing, doing what they want to do. Uh, families can pretty much live where they choose these days. They can get educated the way they want. They can own their own home. They can invest in stock markets, invest in all sorts of products. Still a lot of restrictions. Nowhere near as free as it is in the West, perhaps. But it's certainly not a communist country in the way that uh, Marxism says that all resources must be owned by the state. That is not the case in China anymore. It was 45 years ago, but not now. Okay. Well, I've known Steve for probably nearly 20 years now. Uh, I knew him well before I met him. I knew him via his research. And uh, I started subscribing to his uh, newsletter back, in, oh, it must be around the turn of uh, 99, 92,000, something like that. I uh, liked his ideas. I liked the fact that he took an international view of things, unlike many other people who look at it in, in the business of uh, analysis and, and subscription newsletter writers. Uh, and he had so many good ideas uh, and was, all, was, was a very balanced and positive view on markets, which really attracted me. And it was 
purely by chance I met him at a Morgan Stanley conference in, uh, in Japan. And I bumped into this guy that he said, well, I'm Steve Zucker. And I said, oh, gosh, I've been reading your newsletters for years now. Lovely to meet you. And, and of course, we became great buddies. And he's been a great friend to us and our business uh, and, our, and our publishing business and our investing business. And uh, I, I take a, a lot of what Steve says very seriously. And uh, I, I'm very, uh, I'm, very, I'm always keen to read, uh, listen, listen to his views and read what he has to say on markets. And as I say, He's one of the few people in this industry that really is an internationalist and takes an international view uh, of, of investing opportunities. Tell me a little bit about his melt-up theory, your thoughts on that in the U.S. Well, I know people are talking about a, a possible melt-up in the U.S., and I can understand the logic behind it, because if you think about it, yes, the, the, the market in America is a bull market right now, but it's not a manic market. It's not done absolutely crazy. It's nothing like we saw in the 99-2000 tech bubble. The, the US market is not in a bubble. It's not in a completely manic phase of irrational exuberance. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's bullish. But I think there is the potential to see a final melt up similar to what we saw in, say, 99-2000 before the tech bubble burst. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to happen, I think it's, but there's a distinct possibility that it could. We're not in that phase yet. I do, yeah. Is that me? No, no, hang on. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. A, no, that's just a little alarm on the instrument here. That just tells us the boat's going to sink. <laughs>